This is Boromini 13, Special Topics Boromini, lecture entitled San Carlino. So we'll finish up with the examination of the Church of San Carlino, or San Carlo alle Quattro Fontane. This is uh, a drawing for the building by Boromini. It's labeled Albertina 173. It's in the collection of the Albertina Museum in Vienna. The most important uh, print collection in the world. It's a, one of a handful of drawings that were collected after Borromini committed suicide. He destroyed most of his possession possessions, but a few things were in the hands of other people. So some of the drawings were collected for the collection in the Albertina. When I was working on the dissertation in Rome, the uh, drawings by Borromini in the Albertina Museum had just been digital, digital, digitized. Uh, so I was able to view them at the Herziana Library in Rome. I didn't have to go to Vienna. So this uh, drawing is a subject of much discussion about Borromini's design process. Uh, uh, there are some people who argue that the geometric figures in the drawing were added later by Borromini, uh, well after uh, the 1630s. Uh, that may be the case, but they still demonstrate uh, the development of the uh, plan of the building and Borromini's ideas behind it. The drawing has a, a quality of uh, pal palimpsest, <clears throat> the uh, layering of traces of uh, previous elements in the work, which can be found in Borromini's drawings and in the architecture. It's a part of the fabric of the city of Rome. Uh, the buildings have uh, layers of traces of previous building histories uh, interwoven into them, as does the city, like most European cities. In the 20th century, the, the Italian architect Carlo Scarpa always displays the quality of palimpsest, uh, all displayed in his projects and his drawings. So uh, the, the uh, uh, plan, uh, Albertina 173, uh, shows the uh, lozenge shape of the worship space, this sort of strange shape that people uh, were curious about. Uh, it shows, the geometry show how Borromini developed the shape he uh, starts with two circles uh, placed tangent to each other, and he inscribes them in, in an ellipse, and then he rounds off the ends of the ellipse to form an oval. So the, uh, an oval is a rounded off ellipse uh, along the circumference of the circles at the top and the bottom. <laughs> and then he inscribes the oval in a rectangle. So the oval inscribed in the rectangle is the Baroque version of the circle inscribed in the square as in the Vitruvian Man of Leonardo da Vinci. So, so Borromini is uh, expressing a Baroque version of Renaissance humanism, uh, something that uh, would have been condemned by the church uh, if they had known that that's what he was doing, uh, which might have been a good reason why he destroyed his possessions before he committed suicide. Uh, so uh, through he he creates these uh, intersecting triangles drawn through the center points of the circles, and with these he locates uh, the sixteen uh, columns uh, along the uh, periphery. The sixteen columns are a reference to uh, Bramante's Tempietto in Rome, another uh, icon of Renaissance humanism that would have been questioned by the church. Uh, so uh, the drawing, so these are the practical uses of the geometry that Borobini makes to uh, set up this uh, undulating plan with the alternating straight and curved sections, uh, which also appear in elevation in the form of the Palladian motif. The flat lintel and the curved lintel and the arches are play, placed above the curved parts of the elevation. 
So uh, Boromini is following uh, pretty closely uh, instructions laid out by Sebastiano Sirlio uh, in his five books of architecture, the great treatise of mannerist architecture in Rome, for the construction of an oval, uh, which involves uh, the intersecting triangles. Uh, and then in this uh, diagram from Sebastiano Sirlio's treatise, you see the construction of the oval involving the two circles placed tangent to each other and then the intersection of the triangles. So all of this, all of these geometrical exercises that Borromini is using uh, are well established uh, in architecture in Rome at the time as methods of geometrical construction. There's a, uh, another drawing in the Albertina collection, Albertina 208B, an early preparatory sketch by Borromini showing the intersecting triangles and uh, in the construction of the oval for the plan. So it's all very clear that that's what Borromini had in mind, that that was his method in constructing the uh, what ends up being a sort of bizarre looking uh, plan uh, if you don't understand the underlying geometrical progressions. Uh, so the circle is present, uh, the octagon is present as the uh, corners of the rectangle are chamfered, just like in the cloister, <clears throat> uh, and the uh, cross is present, uh, the centralized cross or Greek cross. So the three geometries, the cross, the octagon, and circle are present in the plan, just like they're present in the pattern, in the coffering, in the dome, and in an emblem, in the lantern. Uh, in the uh, worship space, uh, the, the presence of the geometries is hidden. You can't see them behind the forms, whereas they're laid out in a pattern in a cupola and resolved in an emblem and a lantern. So this would correspond to how you would perceive nature. Uh, uh, when you perceive nature, the, the forms appear to be uh, wild uh, and uh, unexplainable, but, but you know... Uh, or you have the ability to understand that nature grows according to mathematical proportions, like the uh, golden ratio and the Fibonacci series and the Pythagorean uh, harmonies. So those proportions are present, you, you just can't see them, which is in the case in the worship space. But then those patterns and ratios are organized and made sense of in the human mind, as they are in the cupola, and then they're resolved into a singular uh, origin as they are in the lantern in San Carlo. So the different elevations of San Carlo correspond to the Neoplatonic hierarchies. The mind of God at the top, from which everything emanates in a teleology, going towards the top, creating a circuitous spiritualis. And then the uh, second level is the mind of man, and then the lowest level is uh, nature in its wildness where the uh, proportions and patterns are there you just can't see them so Borromini uses a completely rational process to create an, irra an irrational form just like nature does this is a, a theme in architecture uh, that's uh, of interest to architects throughout the history of architecture uh, in fact when I was in uh, architecture school uh, I had a studio with Peter Eisenman, and the assignment in the studio was to design a building that uh, is completely rational but looks irrational. It was uh, not an easy assignment, but that's exactly what's happening here uh, with uh, Borromini trying to emulate nature uh, by using a rational process to produce an irrational looking design. But I, Plotinus was famous for saying that the true artist doesn't copy the forms of nature. The true artist copies the principles by which nature uh, forms its forms. That's called the natura naturans in art, uh, the copying the principles of nature as opposed to the natura naturata or mimesis, just uh, eyeballing the forms of nature in perception. So all of this is uh, being uh, uh, followed by Borromini and his design for San Carlo. 
and he's following the uh, ideas that were being discussed at the Academia di San Luca, the Disegno Interno, the, exter the internal design is the lineament, it's a syncretic historicist composition following Alberti, where the lineament becomes uh, the form in the Scintilla della Divina, uh, the spark of the divine, uh, the connection to uh, God and the mind of God. Bormini does this. He doesn't use the actual uh, mathematical proportions like the golden ratio uh, in the Fibonacci uh, series, but uh, his uh, the genesis of the plan is clearly a spark of the divine, the divine in the disegno uh, interno as the, the plan developed. So Borromini is emulating nature, he's emulating the principles of artistic production in the 17th century Rome. He's really, he's following to the letter uh, the, the construction of the oval, the uh, precedents from all the other architects, uh, uh, combining them to the letter. There's nothing unordinary or irrational about the process, but the, the result is something that looks uh, quite extraordinary and uh, irrational. And the problem was that uh, people just just didn't understand what he was doing. Uh, so uh, in architecture, in the turn to the neoclassical period and the Enlightenment, there was a general rejection of Borromini's architecture as being unexplainable and irrational and extravagant. And it really took 300 years, as I mentioned, before people started to actually figure out uh, what Borromini was actually doing beginning with Paolo Portoghese in the 60s and Leo Steinberg with his dissertation and Marcello Fagiolo. And so when I wrote my dissertation, I was trying to uh, follow uh, that uh, lead. Uh, so, and people, now, just like with Caravaggio, people now appreciate the genius of Borromini uh, in architecture in the 17th century. So the, uh, that's a diagram from uh, a, an edition of uh, Alberti's De Re Edificatoria, showing the, uh, what's called the squaring of the, the circle, or also called the quadratura, uh, where the uh, plan of the temple uh, is generated from um, uh, polygonal figures inscribed in a circle, uh, similar to Borromini's uh, plan development for San Carlino. So again, following the prescription of Alberti. So the intersecting triangles uh, would certainly be known to Borromini in relation to the uh, figure of Paradigmatica of Nicholas Cusanus, the uh, intersecting triangles of light and dark in the coincidentia positorum and the process of creation. Uh, so there's no question that uh, Borromini is uh, referencing this uh, and incorporated it in, into his design of the building and into the architecture to emulate uh, the process of creation by the demiurge, as in the uh, uh, Timaeus of uh, Plato, uh, in the architecture. So the, like Palladio said, the, uh, the, the building is a, a microcosm of the cosmos, uh, a mini temple uh, that's a model of the uh, temple of the universe. So this is incorporated uh, in Borromini's architecture also. Uh, Nicholas Cusanus's uh, uh, figure of Paradigmatica was uh, referred to by a contemporary of Borromini's in Rome, a philosopher named Athanasius Kircher. Uh, Kircher was a, a German uh, scholar who came to Rome. He was invited to Rome by uh, Urban VIII, Maffeo Barberini. Kircher uh, uh, became the head of the mathematics department of the Collegio Romano in Rome, uh, the old uh, Roman college, which is still there. Uh, Kircher was a very prolific writer. Uh, he wrote uh, treatises on all kinds of different subjects. Uh, he was the most widely published uh, scholar of the 17th century and the most uh, influential. Uh, you may never have heard of Athanasius Kircher. Uh, the reason is that uh, his contemporaries in the 17th century were the pioneers of science, Galileo and uh, uh, Enlightenment thinking like uh, uh, Descartes or Johannes Kepler. 
Uh, so Atanasius Kircher's approach to philosophy was based in the classical tradition. He's sometimes called the, the last classical philosopher or the last Neoplatonic philosopher. Uh, so they became outdated uh, with the growth of science in the subsequent centuries. So Kircher was kind of uh, forgotten as a major influence uh, in uh, philosophy, although he was uh, the major influence in the 17th century. Uh, he uh, and Borromini were associates. Uh, Borromini took a class taught by Kircher at the College of Masons in Rome. They, it appears that they collaborated for a preliminary design of the Fountain of the Four Rivers uh, with the uh, oval and the uh, intersecting forces of uh, fertility and drought represented by the lion and the horse. So that diagram that we're looking at there could be the original plan for the Fountain of uh, the Four Rivers. These are diagrams in uh, manuscripts by Kircher uh, that he created in Rome in the 17th century uh, using some elements of uh, Cusanus's philosophy and some elements of uh, Pseudo-Dionysus philosophy. So at the top you have a diagram of the celestial hierarchies of Pseudo-Dionysus uh, with the three levels corresponding to the Trinity, and then the three levels within each level of the Trinity corresponding to the nine levels that mediate between the mind of man and God, <clears throat> according to Pseudo Dionysus. So again, they are the seraphim, the cherubim, and the thrones at the top, the dominations, virtues, and powers in the center, and the principalities, archangels, and angels at the bottom. So this was the uh, mysticism, Pseudo-Dionysus, the, the division of the three within the three that can be found in the Sistine Ceiling by Michelangelo, or the Galatea by Raffaello, or in Borromini's San Carlo alle Quattro Fontane, with the, th the cross, the circle, and the octagon uh, hidden in the plan, organized in a pattern in the cupola, and uh, resolved in an, a single emblem in the lantern. So uh, Kerker starts with these uh, the diagram of the celestial hierarchies. Then he inserts it into an oval, uh, and then he uh, overlaps the intersecting triangles of light and dark from the Figura Paradigmatica of Nicholas Cusanus to suggest the coincidence of opposites in the process of creation and the uh, process of creation in the celestial hierarchies. So all of these things are combined by Kerker and they all appear in uh, Borromini's San Carlo. You have the intersecting triangles, you have the oval, you have the three groups of three in the elevation, representing the celestial hierarchies and the, Neo, uh, and the Neoplatonic hierarchies. Uh, so basically, this diagram that appears in a manuscript by Kircher in the Vatican Library is a, uh, uh, could be seen as a parti for Borromini's entire building. Yeah, the entire building is uh, created as a three-dimensional catechism uh, of this diagram, uh, uh, combining uh, the processes of creation with the, the hierarchies of being and the coincidentia oppositorum. If you sort of telescope this, you would uh, end up with a uh, general uh, design for the uh, worship space of the church. So, so I, the first year that I did my dissertation research in Rome, I spent a lot of time in the Vatican Library. I, I was only living 10 minutes, a uh, 10 minute walk uh, north of it. So I would just get up every morning and I'll walk to the Vatican Library and go through the manuscripts in the Vatican Library. Uh, and there are tons of them there by Kircher. Uh, a, a handful of his uh, treatises have been translated into English or Italian but most of them have not. Uh, most of uh, Kircher's writings are uh, in the Vatican Library in their original manuscript form, uh, untranslated. Uh, they're not uh, easy to read. Uh, he wrote in a combination of Latin and Italian. He would start one sentence in Latin and then uh, finish it in Italian. Uh, I I'd never attempted to translate a whole manuscript, but <clears throat> a lot of my dissertation is based on uh, translations of passages <clears throat> from these manuscripts uh, of characters that I found uh, in the uh, Vatican Library. 
along with these uh, diagrams that he incorporated. He, he incorporated a lot of visuals uh, in his manuscripts. So, so it became clear that you know, 80% of what Kircher produced is still unknown. It's, it's just sitting there in the Vatican Library, has never been translated into English or Italian or any other language. Uh, and so you would have to conclude that, that our, our understanding of uh, the culture of 17th century Rome is pretty, still pretty incomplete at this point, um, that a lot of uh, the work just hasn't been translated yet, and that further translations are needed and further work is done in order to further uncover uh, all of the uh, intricacies of uh, the uh, culture of the Baroque in 17th century Rome. So I always recommend to people, if, if you're looking for a, a purpose in life or a project to devote your life to, that would be a good one. Translate these uh, manuscripts by Kircher and the Vatican. I, I wasn't up to it. So there's a, a, a similar diagram uh, by Kircher uh, in his Sphera, or his Sphera Amoris, or Sphere of Love. And uh, in the uh, uh, treatise uh, about the uh, Pamphili obelisk, which is, you know, he, he uh, inscribed the hieroglyphs into the obelisk in the Fountain of the Four Rivers, commissioned by the Pamphili family, Innocent X. So that's what that's about. So in the Sphere of Morris, you also have the, uh, or the Sphere of Love, you also have the intersecting uh, triangles of light and dark in the process of creation. So uh, the plan is telescoped uh, into the worship space. And so that's how you end up with this undulating entablature with the alternating uh, curved section and straight section. And then above that, you have the uh, torqued uh, arch. I, I usually don't use black and white photographs, but, but this one uh, shows the torque of the arch really well. Uh, how Borromini is using the calculus and pulling the arch forward and how it really shows the pressure of the cornice up above uh, that's showing the tectonic force. And then the uh, round or the uh, ovuloids and the pendentives with the scenes from the life of Carlo Borromeo carried by the seraphim. And then in the uh, uh, cupola <clears throat> up above the inside of the dome, the pattern uh, inscribed uh, with the cross, the octagon and the circle, the three geometries which are hidden in the wild worship space below, but uh, uh, combined in a singular emblem in the lantern up above. And then there's a, a good view of the four uh, lights, or three of them anyway, the lantern and then the two, and then the uh, small oculi uh, above the cornice, creating the pyramid of light, uh, representing the light cosmology <clears throat> from Egyptian theology, the emanation. All matter comes from light. All multiplicity comes from singularity. So a nicer view of that. Uh, recently cleaned interior, showing a nice, uh, fresh, uh, white painted uh, stucco plaster all over the place. There's a detail of the Trump loyal uh, coffered barrel vault that's supposed to be going off into the distance with the rosettes and the coffers to make you feel like you're in the uh, uh, at the crossing of St. Peter's. <clears throat> uh, and you can see there's a good view of, you can see the uh, <clears throat> in the uh, column capitals underneath the flat lintel. Uh, you can see how the uh, scroll is turned up there, the vol volute, whereas it's turned down underneath the uh, curve section of the entablature. So here's a, a bird's eye view looking down from the uh, cupola down towards the worship space. And uh, it's, uh, there's an interesting detail. You, if you follow the cornice, and then you can see the uh, torqued arches uh, below the uh, cornice that are torqued to uh, show the tectonic force placed on by the cornice. But as you can see from this view, the cornice doesn't even touch the arches. So there's no tectonic force going on. There's no uh, structure going on uh, in this view anywhere. The dome is supported by buttresses that are hidden behind the walls, just like at St. Peter's or Sant'Andrea in Mantua. 
So you can only see that if you're a, a bird uh, up in the cupola, up above the worship space. I actually went up there when I, after I presented my paper on Borromini at the conference at the Palazzo Barberini in uh, 1999, the thir 300th anniversary of uh, Borromini's birth. And then I was invited to go to San Carlino here uh, by the person in charge of restoration, Paolo Denny, and, uh, and talk about my ideas to the uh, restoration workers on the scaffolding. So I was actually able to climb up the scaffolding uh, fairly high and be able to see the details uh, at the top of the worship space there. So uh, the uh, geometries are in a pattern uh, in the plan. Uh, the cross, the octagon, and the circle, and then they're superimposed in an emblem in the lantern on the ceiling of the lantern. I thought I, I turned the slide around. It's upside down there. Oh well. Uh, but you have the uh, cross uh, in the form of the holy dove uh, and the octagon in the circle, creating a kind of an emblem uh, representing uh, God. So the three geometries are, uh, represent the mind of God, and they correspond to the human mind as they're organized in the pattern in the cupola and as they're hidden in the generation of the plan below. So there's another view of the light coming through the cupola and the bottom of the cornice. There's a, <clears throat> a engraving, a popular engraving in 17th century Rome showing the uh, pyramid with the sun as the apex and the edges of the pyramid, the rays of the sun forming uh, the material earth below corresponding to the square base of the pyramid, uh, all straight from Egyptian cosmology uh, and as illustrated by Borromini at San Carlo. There was still there, uh, there's a, there was a uh, sanctuary uh, or a temple dedicated to Isis uh, from a, from the Aeneid in Egyptian cosmology. It was right next to the uh, uh, Pantheon. It's where uh, Santa Maria Sopra Minerva is uh, now. Um, and so it's uh, possible that there was uh, an active uh, uh, worship of Egyptian uh, cosmology going on in Rome in the 17th century. <clears throat> So the, uh, the, the pattern in the cupola, the cross, the octagon, and the circle, uh, as we saw, uh, Bramante used it for the buildings at Santa Maria Presso San Satiro in Milan. Uh, Borromini's uncle, Carlo Maderno, used it as a ceiling pattern in St. Peter's. Uh, and so it appeared in other places in Rome in the 17th century. So it was a pretty familiar pattern. Uh, Borromini's uh, use of the patterns is a little different because he projects it onto the interior of the dome or the cupola, the concave surface. So it's much more complex than it would be just on a flat surface. Uh, Borromini not only uh, carves the pattern into the concave surface of the cupola, but as you can tell, the uh, geometries get smaller <clears throat> as they go up toward the lantern. This uh, creates the illusion that the lantern is higher than it actually is. Another optical trick or a trump loyal trick uh, that Borromini liked to use that was popular in the Baroque. <clears throat> so it's a, an incredibly uh, complex uh, pattern. And, uh, you know, imagine doing this without a computer. There, there's the emblem right side up with the dove forming the cross and then the uh, octagon and the circle. Uh, the, the triangle is also in there for the Trinitarians, uh, representing the singularity from, all, from which all multiplicity uh, emanates. But uh, car carving this, it, it must have been the equivalent of uh, Michelangelo's Pieta in sculpture, trying to uh, carve this without any uh, mechanical help with a computer or anything like that. Sometimes I think that when you look at a sculpture by Michelangelo Bermini, Bernini or a building by Borromini that are the, all, that's all hand carved, it's hard to imagine that, that a human being would be capable of doing that uh, anymore. So the, uh, uh, when you walk around the interior 
of uh, San Carlino. Uh, there is no privileged point of view, and every point of view is different. So it's like being in a, a giant kaleidoscope. It's constantly moving around and changing as you move in it. So it's like Bernini's sculpture. It's, it's designed to be a theater in the round. It's unlike Brunelleschi's architecture, where there's a privileged point of view and a vanishing point, or Michelangelo's sculpture, where when you go look at the David, you're, you're supposed to stand in one spot to get the best view. That's not the case in the Baroque, in the sculpture or the architecture. It's a theater in the round. It's a, in the process of movement and action. Uh, people often use the word movement uh, in relationship to Baroque architecture. Baroque architecture doesn't actually move, but it, it suggests movement in the variation of the forms. You know, just like way back in classical Greek sculpture, uh, Myron suggested movement in his sculpture of the Discosaur or the Discobolos. So it's a different way of approaching art and architecture, a different way of engaging the viewer uh, than in the Renaissance. And it's all part of the propaganda of the Counter-Reformation to draw you back into the uh, sphere of the Catholic Church. There's a, one more black and white slide showing the uh, detail of the uh, emblem uh, up above with the cross, the octagon, the circle, and the triangle symbolizing God and the origin of, and the mind of God and the origin of the multiplicity of the proportions and geometries from the infinite simplicity of the mind of God, which is inaccessible. There's another popular engraving that was circulating around Rome in the 17th century that shows Atlas holding the world in the form of an armillary sphere, the, the circular uh, armillary sphere that was popular in the Renaissance, showing the uh, circular orbits of the planets. <clears throat> so the uh, sphere, the armillary sphere is illuminated by the torch of an angel from up above and its shadow is projected on the ground. And of course the shadow of the circular armillary sphere is an oval. Uh, so this so shows the relationship between the Renaissance and the Baroque. Uh, Renaissance humanism is the belief that the human mind can understand the mind of God <clears throat> through uh, mathematics and geometrical proportions. It's all perfectly clear. Uh, but in the Baroque, in the mysticism of the Baroque, uh, the realization has been come to that uh, only the uh, shadows of the archetypal reality can be perceived uh, in human perception and the human mind, and that the archetypal reality, in Platonic terms, is uh, beyond what we can per perceive. So, again, it's the allegory of the cave. Uh, the shadows that we see, we can in the shadows, we can only see the oval. We can't see the perfect sphere outside the cave that the light is projecting onto the walls of the cave. So uh, that corresponds to uh, uh, Platonic philosophy and Plotinus and the mysticism of the Baroque. It's uh, all present in the design of uh, San Carlino by Borromini. So this is uh, Athanasius Kircher. Kircher means uh, churcher, uh, church guy in German. Uh, he uh, and Borromini uh, apparently were friends. Uh, he was a very prolific writer, philosopher in Rome. There's the uh, Collegio Romano building. It's uh, right uh, in back of the Church of St. Ignatius, the uh, second largest Jesuit church in Rome dedicated to Ignatius Loyola that has another uh, famous ceiling fresco by Andrea Pozzo that we'll look at that displays the uh, apophatic theology. This is all just a couple blocks from the uh, Trevi Fountain right in the center of Rome. So just a couple examples of the manuscripts by Kerker uh, in the Vatican. This is called Ars Magna Lucet, Lucis et Umbre which means the great art of light and shadow. So it's a treatise on perception and perspective. This is the frontispiece uh, for it, uh, the, the uh, decoration on the front of it, the engraving around the front page. Uh, and it uh, displays uh, the same three uh, Neoplatonic hierarchies or 
ontological hypostases that are displayed by Borromini at San Carlo. You have the wild, irrational, uh, unexplainable forms of nature down below that are hide, hiding the mathematics and the proportions. Up above, in the, in the center, <clears throat> you have the, the patterns and the proportions that are on display in the human mind. Uh, and then as, as reflected uh, in perception, uh, as shadows in the physical world down below. And then up above you have the emblem of God uh, from which uh, everything emanates uh, in the uh, circuit circuitous spiritualis. Uh, another example would be the frontispiece from the Musurgia Universalis or Universal Music by Athanasius Kircher. Uh, he was a very, very prolific writer on the subject of music. Uh, in the frontispiece to the Musurgia Universalis, again, you have the wild, irrational forms of nature down below. <clears throat> you have the geometries and patterns of the human mind in the center. And then uh, you have the, there's an emblem up there, but it's, you can't see it. It looks more like a blinding void of light, just like the Cathedra Petri of Bernini or the uh, Assumption of the Virgin of Correggio, from which uh, everything comes, all multiplicity comes from the singularity, and all matter comes from the light, and it emanates uh, in the three ontological hypostases, or levels of being, uh, down below, as illustrated by Kerker. Then uh, one more example by Kerker, there's many of them. This is the frontispiece to his manuscript on uh, arithmetic, De Arithmologia, so one more time, you have uh, the wild, uh, irrational forms of nature down below, uh, the patterns of the geometries and mathematics of the human mind in the center, uh, and then the emblem at the top representing uh, the source of all of the ideas in the mind of God uh, that uh, the human mind participates in through the Shintala della Divinita, the spark of the divine, as expressed at the Academy de San Luca, and so this is the this is the dominant philosophy of the 17th century, as described by its most important philosopher Athanasius Kircher, and as clearly displayed uh, in the architecture of uh, Francesco Borromini. <clears throat> so there's no, it, it's it's pretty it's obvious it's pretty clear that this is a, a good explanation for Borromini's architecture that San Carlo is clearly intended as a catechism or an edificium of uh, this uh, Neoplatonic uh, philosophy that was uh, widely spread around Rome at the, Rome at the time. But, it, you know, that was, it was, mis it was not understood uh, for a long time throughout the classical and the, or the neoclassical and the enlightenment period. Um, it, it's uh, not very well understood in the United States because most people in the United States aren't very familiar with uh, the history of European philosophy. Uh, most people in the United States uh, tend towards empiricism rather than metaphysics because, uh, you know, we live in a culture dominated by science and technology. So it was interesting when I was working on my dissertation, yeah, if I... I would meet somebody in Italy and I would talk to them about my dissertation and I would explain my idea that there are, uh, you know, these Neoplatonic hierarchies in Borromini's architecture. The response would usually be, well, yeah, it's obvious. <laughs> What's the big deal? Everybody knows that. <laughs> but then, then I uh, would kind of, I came back to the United States and I would, I would talk to, I would explain to somebody the same thing that, you know, my, understanding of Borromini's architecture, that it was a catechism of these uh, Neoplatonic philosophies. And, and they would, and people in the United States would look at me like I was crazy. Like, what? What are you talking about? That, that can't be true. That's not the case. So it's kind of, kind of interesting how, the, uh, under, uh, the, how you understand uh, architecture differently uh, in different cultures and different places. Uh, Kerker was a uh, archaeologist. Uh, he had a very large archaeological collection, which became the basis for the archaeological museum in Rome. Uh, there was a in about 1999 or 2000 there was an exhibition and a book published called Museo del Mundo, the Museum of the World, uh, putting uh, elements of his uh, archaeological collection on display 
there's the pamph there's an obelisk in the center with his uh trans his uh, inscription of the hieroglyphs which he uh, he was a uh, an avid Egyptologist, but unfortunately mistranslated the hieroglyphs as, as did everybody else until the 19th century when the Rosetta Stone was discovered uh, by Napoleon when he invaded uh, Egypt. Uh, so some of the things that are interesting in the Muse Museo del Mundo, uh, these are inventions by Kerker. Uh, this is, appears to be some sort of uh, camera obscura uh, uh, the device that Caravaggio may have used. So there's a, you have a room, uh, the camera, camera means room, a dark room, obscura means dark. Uh, and there's a, 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 a tiny hole that the light comes through and the light is projected on a screen and the screen is gridded uh, and the painter uh, just traces the outline of whatever he's looking at, in this case, the plant outside. But of course, uh, in the camera obscura, uh, the image outside gets flipped upside down when it's projected on the screen and the inside. So you can see that plant on the outside, and there it is upside down on the screen on the inside. Uh, and so the painter just traces the lines and is able to create, like Caravaggio did, a hyper-realistic uh, uh, painting. So uh, this is a little bit later than Caravaggio uh, and you know Kerker was the uh, uh, head of the department at the Collegio Romano so he can't exactly get away with uh, disseminating heretical ideas uh, in the Inquisition uh, so the uh, uh, ideas may have been a little more relaxed by this point in time. Here's an, another invention uh, by Kircher that appears to be some sort of slide projector, which we used to use in class, but we don't anymore. So the uh, images uh, on the uh, sort of diaphanous uh, slides there get slid across and projected onto the wall by the flame uh, th through the periscope behind it. Looks like some sort of Vitruvian man being projected on the wall. By, so Kerker was he was very prolific. He was very inventive. Uh, he laid important foundations for Roman history and culture, society. But uh, his uh, philosophy has been largely forgotten because he wasn't uh, up to date uh, with the pioneers of science who were his uh, contemporaries in Europe. So uh, the, the focus of the dissertation was uh, San Carlino uh, with a little bit about Santivo and the Oratorio, so which uh, we'll look at in the next uh, section. Uh, but th this was the basic idea that uh, the architecture is a catechism of the philosophy of the 17th century, uh, as you would expect it to be. Uh, and which is most of what I learned when I was doing my dissertation research in uh, Rome. So the, the title of the uh, dissertation speaks to that, the relation between the architectural forms and the philosophical structures, uh, which I would uh, later broaden to uh, other uh, studies of other works in relationship to the philosophies. So there's the uh, portrait of uh, Borromini, a young Borromini, probably by Bernini, that I used for the cover. Uh, this book was just published last year, Finding San Carlino Collected Perspectives on the Geometry of the Baroque. Uh, so I, I have a, a chapter in the book where I discuss uh, my ideas about the, the title of my chapter is uh, The Deep Structure of San Carlino. So the, the deep structure is uh, from uh, uh, Chomsky and linguistics and structural linguistics in the 20th century, the, the underlying unseen structure of language. So that would be the uh, hidden geometries in San Carlo and how they uh, are a catechism for the Neoplatonic hierarchies. And I, and I sort of included an autobiographical uh, element talking about my uh, 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 experiences with uh, Leo Steinberg in New York and Paolo Portoghese and Marcello Fagiolo in Rome and the uh, process of writing the uh, dissertation. So that was my most recent 
contribution to Borromini Scholarship. So that concludes the section uh, finishing up with uh, the Church of San Carlino, entitled San Carlino. So in the uh, next section, we'll look at the uh, Oratorio and Santivo, the uh, other two major works by Borromini in Rome.